As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Thank you, Tammy. Our second reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, the first five verses of the book of Acts. You may know the book of Acts is actually a sequel to the Gospel of Luke. Uh, both books are written by the same person, and Acts continues the story after the um, death and resurrection of Jesus. And these first five verses are ad addressed to a person named Theophilus. You'll hear that name in just a minute. The, the name Theophilus means the lover of God, and it's not clear if that was an actual person or if Luke was addressing this passage to everybody who loves God. That, that's not clear. But anyway, this is how it goes. Acts 1, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> In the first book, Theophilus, that's the book of Luke, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, this is the important part, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This he said is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit and not many days from now. This ends the reading of our lessons for this Sunday morning. God is speaking to us through these words. When God speaks, the words are true, and we can trust them. Would you pray with me, please? May the words that I speak and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. I want to return briefly to three things I introduced last Sunday. The first is the creed of the Church of Canada that I read at the beginning of that service. Um, notice this time, as you're going to see the words on the screen, with that, notice how the, the creed is divided into three sections. The first section says something about who God is and what God is up to in the world. The middle se section suggests ways we are affected by what God is doing. And the concluding section is the statement of hope and expectation. Last week you heard these words read. This week I'll invite you to say them with me. Follow along on the screen. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. The second thing I want to bring back from last week is this paragraph that will be on the screen, written by the search committee and found in the First Church profile. I think it is a near perfect capture of the hopeful, imaginative, experimental attitude that churches today must have if they want to hear the Holy Spirit and to follow her guidance into this very uncertain future that we face. This is what you wrote. 
we are looking ahead for new creative ways of being and acting as the body of Christ. We seek a pastor who will help us imagine the possibilities and keep us striving for our fullest potential. With us and through us, God is creating a fellowship of persons seeking to explore, expound, and expand in God's limitless creation. We invite a pastor who can lead us in this endeavor. That paragraph brings the rest of your profile to life. But as I said last week, the important question is, do you really mean it? We'll be exploring that do you mean it question today and next week. The third thing I'm bringing back is the article by Cameron Trimble that I referred to last week. This piece she wrote grew out of a workshop uh, she led in 2019 with hundreds of Church of Canada clergy and administrators. Over the course of their time together as they considered the question of whether their churches would survive, they came up with seven observations they wanted to consider. We're going to spend the rest of our time this morning on just the second of those seven. And here it is. <coughs> the structures of many churches, and by structures she means buildings, the structures of many churches we lead today are designed for an era that no longer exists. That's a bold and troubling statement. It's also likely quite true. Some will be able to adapt to this new world. Most will not. That is okay. We can lose the building and still be the church. Now, Trimble is talking here about those churches who, for whatever reason, are not able to maintain their church building and so they end up selling it. I am not going there. I am not talking at all. Please hear that. I'm not talking at all about closing the doors of First Church for the last time. What I want to do this morning, however, is to use this image of a congregation losing its building to drill down deeper into the question of what the church, this church in particular, will look like in what is almost certain to be a difficult time for all churches. I want us to think through this carefully and faithfully until we find the best news that I promise you is hidden behind all the bad news. Now, we're not going to get there today, but this will, I think, be the beginning of a useful conversation. We're going to begin with a little thought experiment, and for this, I'm going to need your help. Imagine. Use your imagination. Late tonight, an unexpected storm comes over Sauk City, a big one, dumping buckets of rain, large hail, and a freak tornado, a real freak tornado that flies over the city without incident until it drops onto the education wing of your building, slams through the sanctuary, demolishes the parsonage, jumps across the street, and takes out almost every tree in the first church park and hops back up into the sky and goes away. Rose is on the phone first thing Monday morning with the insurance agent. And she hears this nervous rustling of papers over the phone. And finally, the agent says, Rose, according to our records, the church hasn't paid its insurance premiums in three years. We canceled your insurance policy two years ago. Sorry, Rose, the church has no insurance. Nothing of the first church structure remains, except for a few soggy hymnals, some shards of stained glass, and a huge bill for cleaning up the mess. Everything is gone. Now, this is not going to happen. But just imagine if it did. What would you think? How would you feel? Remember the words from your profile. We are looking ahead for new creative ways of being 
and acting as the body of Christ. We seek a pastor who will help us imagine the possibilities and keep us striving for our fullest potential. Now, while um, Denny plays a short musical interlude for us, I want you to think about the two questions that will be on the screen while, while we're listening to the music. And then I'm going to ask you to respond to these questions. The first one is, what is your fullest potential when your church home is a pile of rubble? When the building at the corner of Madison and Washington is gone and cannot be rebuilt? Or to put that same question another way, when it comes to being the church for today, in our strange and changing world, what really matters? Think about that for just half a minute or so while he plays. That, by the way, was the opening to Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, one of my very favorite pieces from a long time ago. I sent Denny an um, email this week and said, can you play part of that? And of course, he said, sure. And that's why you got to hear it. Tammy, thank you for handling the microphone. I want to hear your responses to these two questions. And notice I said responses and not answers. There is no right or wrong answer here, only what you think and what you feel. Imagine the scenario, what do you think? Cameras first. We won't be on the recording then. The two words that Close. came to my mind immediately, because I could see it, and, and I was devastated, but what really matters to me, and I'm a new congregant, is that we are a community united in service to others, and that's what struck to me. We don't need a building, but we need to stay united with the purpose of being of service to others. So the idea she has is that the, the important thing, what matters, is staying together as a community organized for the purpose of doing good in the world. Thank you. Somebody else? Shirley. Um, the first thing that came to mind for me is family, the church family that we have and the bond that we have with each other and with God. Yeah, the, the, uh, the community that is here, the family that is here, the bonds that hold, uh, hold us together, those are incredibly powerful and incredibly important. Rose. What came to me is um, brick and mortar can come and go, and as long as we have each other, which is very similar to what they said, and we are all safe, that we know that God is protecting us, and spiritually we will get through it with God's help and with each other's help. I'm, I'm seeing a pattern developing here in your responses. Mark. I guess what crossed my mind is a picture of a pastor and a congregation that were worshiping in folding chairs outside of their church that had been rubbled by a tornado or a hurricane. I don't remember. I just I've had that image for a long time, and it was really goes to what has already been said. It was just uh -huh. the fact that the community just came and 
and and worshipped on Sunday, and you know they were there, and 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 one of the ladies they interviewed said there was more people in church today than we've had for a long time, and I I think that that is what I thought of when I read. Those questions. Yeah, and what's interesting about putting it that way is she said there were, there were more people in church than, than before the building was gone. Think about that image. Lorna. Um, one of the things I was thought it? was that um, if the building was gone, you could stop serving the building and start serving your community because you wouldn't have your time and resources locked up in the building. Yeah, so if, if, if the goal is to, to live in service to the community and the building is what is sucking most of your energy, losing the building could let you transfer that energy to what your deeper goal is, okay? Doesn't anybody want to mourn the loss of this building? I, I would. Fred? I would mourn the loss of the building, I think, because it's, it's a beautiful place. But also, being a, a practical builder kind of guy, I would look at the assets we have left. We have two large pieces of property we could probably do something with and, again, come up with some creative ideas on how to use what we have to serve the community. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for your responses to that. Uh, like I said, this disaster scenario is not going to happen. It is as close to impossible as anything can be. So you don't need to worry about that. Rose, you can sleep tonight. The, the, the building will not be taken down on your watch. <laughs> but you do, you don't need to worry, but you do need to wonder. When it comes to being the church for today, and when it comes to being a community, as you're saying, that exists and lives for the purpose of serving, what, what really matters? How, you, how would you do that? Now, the future for churches, the future for this church is honestly uncertain. You don't know what's coming. But what you do know, apparently, what this, this part of the church gathered today knows, is that there is a life here, there is a community here, a family here that matters. And you know, I think, instinctively, that it is, it is that community that can, can and does exist to be of use to each other, and to the, to the larger community around, that matters. Um, how are you going to do that? Because you have to, whether the building goes away or not, you have to find ways to be that community living on behalf of the larger community. And I would say that this interim space where you are right now, when what was is gone and what is coming is not yet here, this, this is just about the best time you'll ever get to do this wondering together. Now, obviously, we're not going to resolve this question this morning, and since I'm out of time, <clears throat> I have to leave you dangling here until next week. But if you can't wait till next week, I do know of a good coffee shop in town where I would love to sit down with you and buy you a cup of coffee, and we can talk about it. For today, though, I'm going to leave you where we began, with these words. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and in others by the Spirit, we trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, 
to love and to serve others, to seek justice, to resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death, we are not alone. God is with us. Thanks be to God. Amen.